Hello, Amsterdam. I'm so excited to be here. Um, we are an unusual set of companies for many reasons. One of them is that my biggest company, Samasource, is an intentional nonprofit. So we're structured as a nonprofit company. But we're actually now profitable on the basis of our earned revenue. And we do something really weird, which is that we are innovating in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence but using trained humans in the loop. So we have a model that involves giving work to low-income people while also advancing artificial intelligence in some of the biggest tech companies in the world. So I'm going to talk about the two key trends in the future of work. And one of them is the role that humans are playing in some of these AI algorithms of the future. And the second is sustainability. But if there's one thing that you take away from my talk, it's this slide. It's give work. <laughs> Our mission is to give work because we believe that that's the most effective way to fight poverty. And why should we care about poverty? We're here talking about the future of work. How is this relevant? Well, the biggest moral crises of our time outside of climate change are rooted in poverty. Poverty is the reason that 300,000 women still die every year around the world because of preventable issues related to childbirth. Uh, they die because they're poor. It's the reason that close to a billion people lack access to clean drinking water and why over two billion people don't even have a toilet. Now, our approach to solving this problem is usually charity, but I'm going to bring you a different perspective about how we can use technology and specifically AI to create jobs for the bottom of the pyramid. But let's talk first about what someone living at this income level looks like. There are over a billion people around the world today who still earn less than a dollar a day for doing a full day's work. Now, you might think that most of those people are totally uneducated and maybe not capable of doing work, and that's why they're so poor. But I'm going to introduce you to a young man named Ken Kihara. This is Ken and his daughter, Rosaline, outside of where I first met him in his first home in Mathare, which is a slum in Kenya. Now, Ken had graduated from one of Kenya's top boarding schools. He speaks the Queen's English. He can read and write beautifully. So you'd imagine that someone like him would be able to get a job and move out of the slum. Not so. Because in Kenya, and specifically among youth, unemployment rates hover at 70%, 70. Which means that even if you finish secondary school, even if you're top of your class, like Ken was, you're forced to go back to the slum and do informal work to make a living. And what you see behind me is a picture of Mathare. This is actually what Ken was doing when he finished secondary school. He was going and brewing a local kind of moonshine called Chang'a, which they would then sell to people on the street to earn about a dollar a day. This substance is incredibly potent. It's often mixed with kerosene. It's called jet fuel locally. And Ken told me that people in the slum drink this to forget themselves. That is what someone who is educated, who's made every effort to better himself, is relegated to today in 2018. One of the young men who was brewing this stuff when I went to visit uh, told me that he had started a degree program in computer science from a Western Kenyan university. Now, our typical approach to solving this problem is aid, right? We feel bad. We think, oh my goodness, this is terrible. We should go build a well in that community. Or let's donate some shoes. Or let's give them a school. And that model has resulted in roughly a trillion dollars of aid uh, coming from the Western world to Sub-Saharan Africa in the last 60 years. And yet, real per capita income for the lowest band has not really changed. Real incomes for the lowest band has not really changed in 60 years. So there's something flawed with this aid model. We believe that there's a better solution. And that solution is giving work. Work not only provides an income, and now, increasingly uh, large amounts of data show that when we provide an income to the poorest families, they tend to invest in exactly the right things, especially when we provide that income to women. Poor women are shown to reinvest 90% of their paychecks in the health, education, and well-being of their children and community. There is no better aid program than employing the poorest women on the planet. Work also creates a healthier relationship between people and government. Because when you start working in the formal economy, you start getting taxed. And when you start getting taxed, I don't know about you, but I start asking questions like, why didn't the government fix that pothole on my street? Or why is this representative you know, flying around on a private jet? It starts getting you to ask those sorts of questions. And low-income people in developing countries, especially in countries that have a big percentage of their budget coming from aid, they're deprived of that accountability and the relationship, right? Because their governments are mostly funded by foreign donors. 
So work creates a much healthier relationship between people and government and allows people to forge a development path on their own terms. They don't need us going to their communities and telling them how to invest money. They mostly know exactly what to do. It's just a matter of not having the cash. Well, we're lucky because in this day and age, there's an entirely new form of work that we're capable of sending to people like Ken through the internet. This is a photograph that we took in 2012 in northern Uganda that most Westerners know because of a horrible civil war that was waged by the Lord's Resistance Army. They were mostly known for capturing children and turning them into child soldiers. And so the brand of northern Uganda in the West is one of desperation and poverty. And yet this cable has literally rolled out. When people say the internet is rolling out across Africa, that, my friends, is what it looks like. It's uh, these giant spools of fiber optic cable. This cable now reaches that same place, Gulu, in northern Uganda, which was the epicenter of this civil war, which means that there's an entirely new form of work that we can send to parts of sub-Saharan Africa that didn't exist before. This is an example of that type of work. Here's an image from a car sensor. And here is an annotated version of that image. Does anyone have an idea what this might be used for? Self-driving cars, I think I heard someone say. It's exactly right. There's a massive need in the algorithms of the future to use images to train computers to do what humans used to do. And those computer vision processes rely on precise image annotation and data tagging, not just of images, but all kinds of input data. Because of this trend that we saw coming 10 years ago, I founded an organization called Samasaur. Sama means equal in Sanskrit. And we are where artificial intelligence meets human ingenuity. Let me tell you a bit about the process of how these algorithms work and, and how machine learning teams uh, run their life cycle. So it starts with input data. It can be images, it can be video, it can be snippets of text if we're trying to train a chatbot, it can be audio files. And then we need to precisely label that data. Machines learn just like humans learn, right? When we teach a toddler the difference between a tree or a shrub. That's the same thing that these image annotators are doing now. Then that goes into algorithm development. And then one of the end customers of Samasource will push that out into a product that reaches the customer. And then there's a continual loop of, of training. Interestingly, the head of AI at Tesla has said that human labelers are the programmers of the future. And if there's one company that probably understands the appetite for this kind of data, it would be Tesla. There's a revolution happening. And, and most people think that AI means that humans will be totally automated out of the value chain. That's not what we're hearing from the biggest tech companies in the world in Silicon Valley where we sit. And there's some benefits of having a managed workforce that you can develop and train over the crowd. One of those benefits is the feedback loop that you can create between workers like Ken, who are sitting in a center day by day and very passionate about delivering the best quality labeled outputs, uh, and the data scientists at one of our companies that are dependent on this loop being really tight and efficient. Uh, since we started a decade ago, we've become the largest data services company in East Africa, employing about 2,000 people, all of them from extremely low-income backgrounds, on average about $2 a day before Sama. And we've been lucky enough to win some of the biggest clients in tech, including Google and Microsoft. This is what our center looks like in Nairobi. It's much fancier than our San Francisco office. But what I'm most excited about is that we've been able to make this model work not only in big cities like Nairobi, but with subsidy in places like Gulu. So remember that, that cable that I showed you? One of the landing points of the cable is this center, which is located on the campus of Gulu University. When I told the dean of that university back in 2012 that we intended to build a Sama Center, he nearly jumped up and down. He was like, this is the most exciting thing. I believe that the future of work in northern Uganda is technology. He started Facebook messaging me a ton soon after that. But most people would not imagine that in rural Africa, you could set up a tech center. And the benefit of this center, which is off-grid, has solar panels on the roof, and has employed over 500 people inside these shipping containers in that region, the benefit of this approach to giving work is that it's much lighter weight than a factory, right? I don't have to worry about getting finished goods through customs. I don't have to worry about importing raw materials. It's a much more efficient way to create large numbers of jobs than many forms of traditional commerce. And that's the promise of the digital economy. 
Let me tell you a bit about what a worker's experience is before and after Sama. On average, our workers are starting at about $2 a day, which means that they are victimized by all kinds of entirely avoidable suffering solely due to poverty. One of the biggest risk factors for disease and violence in the developing world is living in informal housing in a slum. What you see behind me is Ken and his lovely daughter who used to play next to an open sewer, which was right outside of his one-room house. Again, this is a guy who was educated and totally capable of doing work. We also find that people are eating poor quality food. They're literally eating sugar cane as a primary source of calories. We do all kinds of household surveys to see what people's, are, people's lives are like. We see that they're not able to access health insurance. Post-SAMA, this number is actually out of date, we now on average for the 10,000 workers that we've directly employed have increased their income over the baseline by 500%. And that's not just impacting these workers directly, it's impacting all their income dependents, the families that are reliant on this income. What does a boost of 5x mean if you're starting off at $2 a day? It means all the things you see here. It means health insurance, access to education, dignified housing where you're not afraid if you're a woman that when you go to the bathroom you might get attacked or raped, which happens often in the slum. It is a life-changing difference. And this is the power of work over charity. We've now done this, as I mentioned, for 10,000 workers and their families. So we have moved about 45,000 people, if you include those 10,000 households, from an average income of about $2 a day to over $10 a day, mostly in East Africa. But we're so excited to see how this model can expand. I'm going to tell you a bit about a second business that I started, which is seemingly unrelated, but also based um, with raw ingredients in northern Uganda. And I'm going to tell you about it because today we just launched the business in Europe um, with Cult Beauty, an indie beauty retailer. So I traveled back and forth to northern Uganda all the time, and I thought to myself, what if we could use technology in a different way to bring more transparency into the supply chain for some of the amazing raw ingredients that come from here? And I came across an incredible raw ingredient called Nilotica. It's a rare form of shea butter, and it only grows wild at the source of the Nile River. And I thought to myself, how incredible would it be if I could take this raw ingredient, um, which those ladies sell on the roadside, and turn it into a luxury product. I pass through duty-free every time on my way to East Africa, and I always see these fancy skin creams that sell for $200 and not only do no good for your body, many of them contain ingredients like dimethicone and petroleum-based derivatives and endocrine-disrupting chemicals, but they're not even good for the world. So what if we could build a brand that showcased the people at the base of the supply chain? And especially as women, we're often buying these products and we're not aware that there may be women in the supply chain who could benefit from this $200 expense. So we built uh, what became the first fair trade brand to launch nationwide at Sephora in the US called Luxme. And Luxme is about rare plant-based ingredients that give work to low-income women and uh, embedded in clean beauty formulas. So we just launched today with Cult Beauty, and you can learn more and meet some of the people behind the skincare at Luxme.com. And we did something really innovative. We actually printed um, batch numbers on all of our launch products so that you could actually type in the number on our website and meet the woman who harvested the nuts in your jar. And I'm so excited about many innovations that are now happening in the supply chain. Uh, blockchain allows us to do full traceability in a way we could never before uh, with people who are at the base of the supply chain and so often invisible. So I'm going to um, end with what this means for the future. And how do we embed some of these principles into our life and work? Well, if you're at a company today, you can take part in what's becoming the give work movement. I just wrote a book about this in September. You can decide to use your supply chain to do good. So often we relegate doing good to CSR. We think I'm going to make all this money I can in my nine to five job, and then I'm going to retire one day and I'm going to donate it to charity. Meanwhile, the world is burning. Meanwhile, people like Ken are working for a dollar a day in a slum. With, an, with a full education, right? We can change that. We can create more companies like Samasource that serve a social mission and also advance AI. And if we decide we're going to embed social impact into the way we do business, into procurement, into how we find vendors, we're going to result in a, we're going to see a much greater transformation. The world's biggest 2,000 companies spend a whopping $12 trillion, that's trillion with the T, on goods and services. By comparison, the entire global aid budget is $40 billion. 
billion with a B, right? So we see where the greatest impact can be made. It's not in CSR. It's not in the global aid organizations or the NGOs. It's in the way we fundamentally do business. I will end with what happened to Ken Kihara, the young man that I shared the story of earlier. Ken, I last met up with in Beirut, in Lebanon. He was on his first international trip. And Ken was training a pilot group of Syrian migrants who we are now training in digital freelancing skills all over the world. We're training uh, migrants in Europe, and we're now uh, embedding this training with NGOs globally. Ken has now trained 500 young people from Masari and Kibera slums to follow his path and get hired by Samosource. Ken moved out of the slum, his daughter's in one of the top schools in Nairobi, and he's become one of the biggest advocates of our company. I hope one day he runs for office in Kenya. But this is what's possible when we give work rather than aid, when we empower people as producers rather than recipients of handouts. Thank you so much. <laughs>